DAS Department of English. And um, this, this series was made possible by Professor Perry Preston, um, and he's our, our initiative director, Ty Furman. So please give them a round of applause. silk costumes that are extremely gorgeous. It also involves a mask. Uh, the main character often wears a mask, um, and the movement is geared so that the mask can stay very still. But the other elements in the, in the know that we're going to talk about today are the instruments, how the music is put together a little bit, and then we'll demonstrate some of that by performing. This, this is the group Theater Nogaku. We've just arrived. In fact, we're not all here yet. But, uh, <laughs> last, last night, everybody converged in Boston from Tokyo and from Vancouver and from the UK and Michigan and all points everywhere. And we're just here to do this for you. So we're very excited about it and very happy that we've been invited to do this. So let me start by introducing some of the instruments of NO. And I'm going to start with the flute. There are four instruments that are used to accompany no when it's performed on stage. And not all of the plays use all four instruments. There are three drums and one flute. And um, if Laura would come up and uh, demonstrate the flute. The flute, in a Western sense, is a very pure instrument. And you've got the note that's very clear. But in a Japanese flute, in this flute in particular, um, it, it has a special sleeve on the inside that messes up the harmonics uh, series so that it plays out of tune. It plays out of tune on purpose. And that is one of the reasons to do that is to bring out the eeriness of what is often the main character in No, which happens to be usually a ghost, somebody who's coming from the other world to talk about the experience that they had in life and expiate their sins. So let's just hear a little sample of what this tune sounds like. It's got 
got a nice sound, doesn't it? And it's quite piercing. It's not the mellow sound that you give it to us. <coughs> but it does serve a great purpose in, the, in bringing characters in and out of the stage. Uh, it also is used to accompany dance, so it will take the main melody and the dance that the other drums are, are playing with. Um, so it has various, and, and then ornamental uh, purposes where the chorus is singing and the flute will just kind of float on top to give it a little flavor. The next instrument I'd like to introduce is a kotsuzumi. This is a shoulder drum. It's an hourglass drum, two-headed. The chords are not very tight, and the reason for that you'll see when she demonstrates. This is Joyce. Oh! So you hear that there are different tones in this drum. The chords are not very tight, and when she hits it, she can tighten it or loosen it to get different sounds. It's got a kind of a wet sound in this drum, although this drum is a synthetic drum, it's made out of plastic, so it's not sensitive to humidity, but a real uh, drum is made with leather. Uh, it has a high, um, is it cowhide or is it horse hide? Horse hide. Um, and it's very sensitive to humidity, and if it's not a humid day, um, it won't sound very good. And so the drummer will make sure that it's wet by breathing on it in passages where he doesn't have to play. He'll actually take his finger and put his spit on it, or put a wet piece of paper and place it on there, so that it has this nice round sound. In contrast to that, I think you can stay because oh. we'll have you. Uh, we have the old kawa, the old suzumi. This is also an hourglass drum, and it's kind of the opposite of this. Uh, the shoulder drum likes it wet. The hourglass drum here, the old kawa, likes it dry, and. Uh, in fact, so dry that you actually heat up the heads before you assemble the drum, so you can get it as tight as possible. Everyone needs to move this way because we're out of the uh, we're out of the camera, I guess. Oh. <laughs> Is that good? Okay. You can't see things. <laughs> you want to see James? <laughs> oh, 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 Thank you, James. Now, maybe what's got your attention is not so much the sound of the drum, but what are they doing with their voice? <laughs> and uh, it is said that uh, a large portion of a drummer's skill and talent is found in the voice. And they're making these drum calls. The drum calls have two purposes. One is to, because you have a large ensemble performing notes, the actors who are dancing and singing, you've got a chorus of eight people sitting at the side who are singing, you've got three or four instrumentalists who are playing, um, and there's no conductor, there's nobody to tell people where they are in the play, right? So one of the things that helps them do that are these drum calls. They tell you what beat you're on, and they tell you uh, what, the, what the tempo is so everybody can stay together. Doesn't mean that the drums are always leading the band, though. It's a give and take, and the chorus is going to be singing and pulling things out. The drummers will hear that, take that, and then they'll say, well, I'm gonna hold this yo a little bit longer there, and then uh, back and forth so that everybody gets a chance to lead. But there's no conductor, and one of the ways that they stay together is those drum calls. The other thing that those drum calls do, once you get used to the sound, is that they are very expressive emotionally, and you can really make a difference between a uh, lyrical, quiet piece and a martial piece, for example, by the way that the drum calls are done. And maybe, it, James, could you, both of you demonstrate this? If you, um, well, let's just do James. 
let's just think about do um, Sumi Dagawa a very lyrical, quiet thing first. Oh. Oh. hear these together because these two drums actually interlock and you have a basic unit of eight beats and uh, generally the old kawa the large drum his sphere of influence is kind of the first half of that eight beats and the sphere of influence of the kotazumi is the second half of those eight beats but they have interlocking patterns name what you want to do The way that they can do this is there are set patterns with names. And so we say, well, we're going to do a Nagaji, and then we'll go into a Tuzuki, and then we'll do this and that. That's all that they need to know how to, how to play this. So. signals to the chorus and to each other how fast they want to go, what kind of mood they want to create. All right? So the last drum is the taiko. Now the taiko is not used in every play. About half the plays have a taiko, and the other half uh, do not. Yes. And Rick will demonstrate. Uh, again, there are named patterns, and they come in, in standardized, often uh, standardized, uh, sequence. So you can just say, Rick, would you please play a cycle? And he'll know what to do. And I think that's what he'll do for us. Would you play a cycle? <laughs> <laughs> basic ways to organize music and know one is called matched and the other one is called unmatched. We're going to demonstrate a matched section now and uh, that's when the drums are very carefully calibrated to the different syllables in the text and they listen to what is being sung and they hit on specific beats in the text. But there's a whole another section of no that's actually much more interesting and fun to play which is called unmatched and in unmatched you have the drums and the flute going along their own path. And then you've got the singing going along its own path. 
they start at the same place and they keep tabs. You have to listen very carefully to where the other people are in their path and time it so that you finish what you have to do and they finish what they have to do at a specific point, at which point then you go into matched again or something else. So it's, it's not improvised, but it's free. And you're not spe specifically tuning one beat per measure. It's very flexible. And that's a very interesting way to make music. Lots of people liken it to jazz. Uh, and I don't think it's quite the same as jazz because what they're playing is set. But the exact timing of what they play is not set. And so you get uh, kind of a race going on. And uh, it's lots of fun. <laughs> All right, so let's demonstrate then this. We're going to show you a matched um, section from a play called Hagoromo, which is the feathered mantle. And I'm going, if you could please come up, that would be fun. And I'm going to read to you what the text says. This is a story about an angel who comes down to earth and leaves her robe on a pine branch. And a fisherman comes and picks up the robe and takes it away, and he's not going to give it back to the angel. And finally, she convinces him to give it back and teaches him the, because she can't get back home unless she's got the robe, and so she'll die if she doesn't get the robe back. He finally understands this and gives the robe back so that compassion has been taught to humankind. And uh, the last section of it, she dances for him. He demands, actually, that, he, that she dance before he gives the robe back. And at the very end of the play, she dances and then she whirls up into the sky and disappears. And I'd like to read the text there. The graceful eastern dances, countless in number. The graceful eastern dances, countless in number. She dances for mortal kind. The moon palace maiden, shining in the midnight sky. Holy orb of light, lambent with incarnate truth, fulfilling all vows bestowing in full measure her bounty upon the land. The seven sacred treasures, shining among myriad jewels, fall like rain upon the land, a divine gift of plenty. As wonders unfold, time passes away, fleeting as a feathered robe, that in the sea wind furls and flutters, furls and flutters above the pine strand of Mio, through the clouds of Ukishima, soaring past Ashitaka and Fuji's lofty peak. Growing faint, her figure fades into the blue of heaven. Mingling amid the mists of spring, she vanishes away. If you will, please.
presenting vocals and no. One is called kotoba, which means speech or words, and it um, sounds like this. For example, when that, when that angel comes down and says, hey, that's my robe, give it back. That's the first thing she says. Right? So you can imagine, maybe, what it might sound like, um, but this is how it sounds in no. in the actor's own voice. Uh, everybody's going to do it a little bit different. But they all have that same arc where you're going da 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 So let me demonstrate something else. And you can hear it. <laughs> This is how a, a warrior would talk. It's the same pattern. It's the same, you're doing the same thing, but one is very quiet and kind of controlled and, and low. The next one sounds more masculine, more energetic. And if you really get excited and you're in a battle scene or something, So you can get very excited in no as well. There's a wide range that you can do with kotoba. That's the first mode of vocalization. Then there's something in contrast to kotoba, which is called utai. Utai is singing, chanting is how we usually translate it. And within utai, there are two different kinds. There's one called yoagin, which is melodic singing. And there's one called tsiogin, or gogin, which is dynamic singing. 
What you heard them sing here was a kind of melodic singing. And it, you can hear the intervals. The intervals are very simple in note, mostly fourths and fifths. Da, 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 da. Don't lose on fourths and fifths, but usually it's fourths and fifths. Da, 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 da. And you can hear the intervals, right? So if you give that, you can hear the intervals. There's a lot of vibrato in no. And I should mention also that my school of no is different from everybody else here. <laughs> so they, they will sound different when they sing than I sound. But you can recognize it as being no. You can recognize it as being no chant. There's a lot of vibrato involved in that. So that would be the uh, yoagi. That is the, the uh, melodic singing stuff. Now, one that's more interesting for a Westerner, because we, we're not used to it, is the dynamic singing style. And in that, you have um, less emphasis on the actual intervals, the pitch, and more em emphasis on, let's see if I can find, well, I'll just sing something. Furry socket me ribo he say no me. Furry socket me ribo he say no me. I know no lots of rock muradachi kitot. Now, if you were to try to break that down into intervals, you kind of get da 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 da. It's not melodic. It's not pretty. But there's a tremendous amount of energy. I think you'll agree in that kind of vocal production, and it's very effective for warrior scenes. I should also mention that dynamic singing doesn't have to be loud. You can do it softly. It still has that dynamism, but it's not necessarily loud. So those are the three. Speech, melodic, and dynamic. Okay. Are there any questions at this point? Yes? What about the calling of the instrumentalists? Well, it's not counted as chant, yeah, and, and the calling doesn't have any meaning. Those are just syllables that they're using. But um, there, there's a great, huge variety. It's very much an individual thing what those calls are. They all say yo and ho, but how they break their voices and what they do depends on schools, and then within the schools, the individual will sound very different from one person to another. You have to find your own voice. But the principles of the voice production with the tight diaphragm and the tight throat, uh, that's the same. You're, you're, you're using the same principles to produce the sound as you do with the chant. Yes? Does the chorus have uh, multiple singing styles, or is it one style for the chorus? Uh, a no play will go from style to style. If you're talking about melodic sometimes and dynamic other times, yes. And a single play will have, well, even, even sometimes within a single sentence, you can change from melodic to dynamic. Um, so that's very variable. The chorus does not do speech, though. That's reserved for the characters, for the actors. Yes? So in the actor, why is there no expression on the face? Well, remember, I said that there's masks. So we're not wearing masks now, but the main actor in no place usually wear a mask. All, all of the main. Not always, no. The, the only absolute you can say about no is that there are no absolutes. There are, there's always going to be an exception someplace. But in general, the main actors wear masks. And you can see, I mean, how I produce my voice. You don't open your mouth. You keep your mouth closed. You can make a lot of noise and not open your mouth. And that's so that the mask doesn't move. Uh, we'll be demonstrating this to some extent on Saturday, and then you'll, if you come to the performances, you'll see we've got a beautiful new mask that's made for 
for this play, Zadi, Daisy, Poppies. And Sumida River also has a beautiful mask. And everything is geared towards bringing out the life through that mask. Okay? I'd like to show you now, we're going to demonstrate what you can do. Think of this as a palette. This is a palette. You've got these kinds of singing styles. You've got these drums. You've got the flute. Well, what can you make of it that's new? And that's kind of the thing that Theater Nongaku is interested in. We, we make new pieces. We do it in English, and we use these performance techniques to try to tell a story. And Carrie Preston wrote Zadi Dates and Poppies, which is a beautiful, beautiful work. I wrote the music to it so that we could perform it as an old play, and we're going to be doing that. Um, and I'd like to show you what the traditional, can we turn out the lights? Is that going to mess us up? We get. <laughs> I'd like to show you what a traditional text looks like. This is the feathered mantle. And um, this is the text. We just performed this. But look at, there's the red and the blue. The red is um, the kotsuzumi, and the blue is the bolkawa. So these are the two drums. And you see all that they do is they put in the names of the patterns next to the text. And from that, they, professionals can know where those patterns fit into the text. That's all they need to know. So uh, when you learn a piece, you get the text and you write in the names of the patterns by the side of the text. That's what, that's what that is. Now, when you're studying as an amateur or if you're studying starting out as a, pro as a professional, that's really hard to do because you don't know where the beats are going to hit what syllables from this. You just can't tell. So if we can look at the next one. What often happens is that they will write it out. They'll write it out this way. Whoops. So, oh, let's see. This is actually a dance. Can we go down one? Good. This black here, that's the text. This, again, is the same play. This is the feathered row. This black in the middle is the text. The blue is the okawa. The red is the shoulder drum. And the green is the taiko, the stick drum. And you write it all out so you can tell where the hits come. These symbols here are the vocals. Those are the drum calls. So everything is written out like this, and then you can tell what goes with what. And we make these ourselves. Uh, because all we have are the names of the patterns. And so if you really want to match it up, you write it out yourself so that you can tell where it's supposed to go. Okay? Now, how do you get from this to writing a new play in English? How do you notate it? And if we can go to the next one. As I said before, no, in its pure form, is basically three. You've got low, medium, and high um, tones, and they're set in fourths. Actually, from here to the uh, above this line is a fifth, but these are fourths. So you can set it horizontally like this, and so that it matches, so you can put the English in, right? And then this is just traditional Japanese chant that has been transcribed. But if you want to go a step further and you want to do something outside of the no, well, the easiest way to do it is just to add two more lines, which I have done in the top there. Then you have a five-line step. Then you can determine any melody you want. Now, I, in this particular case, I wrote it in the treble clef. There's no key, though. The actor will sing that line in whatever level he wants. What he has to keep are the relative, the relative um, intervals, but it's not in a key. Okay, So that expands the palette. Then all of a sudden, you can write any melody you want. You don't have to keep yourself restricted to what the traditional no does. And if we go to the next, the last page, two more down. Then you can write the drums in up here. So you, you saw those going up and down. Now they're going across this way. And you can match the drums 
to the, uh, to the words in that way. It provides a very flexible sort of medium uh, that you can really write anything you want at that point. And that's a lot of fun to do. So I would like to close this presentation with presenting this little segment of Zadi Dates and Poppies uh, with my <coughs> colleagues here. I left the desert feeling blank as the sand. The taste of power cancelled by the chill of death. They told me to go. I went. I tried not to think, but hoped I could tell my wife I had not given. Yes. 
traditionally, what type of notation system would they have used? Would it have just been something where they wrote down what type of pattern they wanted and then everyone was taught orally what it was, or was there ever a specific? Yes, well, as I showed you there, that you have the text of the play and then people would write in the names of the patterns. Right. And they would learn that orally. Okay. That yeah, one. absolutely. And in fact, it's an oral art anyway. The text also, mm -hmm. it was not text dependent. And if you look back at the old uh, texts of the, of the plays themselves, there's very little notation telling you how to do it. You know, it's just the words. So it, it is definitely orally transmitted. Today, you've got recordings, you've got printed uh, song books, you've got printed um, drum pattern books and things. Um, that's, not, that's not how it was originally done. And they like to keep things secret and in their families and stuff like that, so they would write their own little thing and pass it on to their sons, but they wouldn't show it to anybody else, you know, so they could be special. Yeah. Uh, could you say something about the major schools of no? There are five major main acting schools. There's Hosho, which isn't the first. There's Kansei. <laughs> Kansei is the largest by far. And Kansei is actually divided into smaller sub-schools. Then there's Hosho, and then there's Kongo, and Komparu, and Kita. And I am Hosho, and these folks are Kita. Um, so there's a stylistic difference between what we do. But as the main, the main actors, for example, in the play we were talking about with the feathered mantle, the main actor is the angel. The secondary actor is the fisherman. And there are also schools of actors who specialize in the secondary roles. So there are, they will have different stylistic approaches to that role, but they will only do that. You won't get a secondary actor, actor who does the main role. And they are located mainly in Tokyo and Kyoto? Uh, actually, now most, most of the schools are based in Tokyo, but there are some that are in Kyoto as well, and Osaka. And Osaka. Yeah. Um, and then we didn't even talk about Kyogen, which is a whole different, that's a comedic art form that is a sister art form to, to know. There are different schools. Well, actually, there are only two schools now, but there used to be more. Yeah. Flute, the instruments are also the same way. There are different schools of each of the instrumentalists. Uh, yes? Um, when you uh, use these new English texts um, for your productions, do you find that English tends to fit well pretty naturally with the style, or is it a challenge to get the language to fit with the no style? It's a huge challenge. <laughs> it's very difficult. Uh, mostly, I think, well, the, the rhythms themselves are typically 7 5. You got da 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 da. That is a Japanese feel to the sentence. That's not natural in English. And so that in itself is, is a strength. But then you also have Japanese words, they all end in vowels. The only thing that doesn't end in a vowel, you have an mm sound. Um, so the chant is not set up to end words with consonants, and English has a lot of those. And so it gets very challenging to make the text understood and to get the, the uh, stress in the right place for the right syllable. It's a, it's, it's a puzzle that you have to work out. And as a composer working on this, I find that Rather than try to use traditional patterns and then stick the English into that, I do it the other way around. And I, if I have to, I'll write new drum patterns or do unusual things with, with the music so that the text remains as natural as possible. Yes? Uh, can you talk about the origins of No? And you mentioned that it was mostly performed for um, aristocratic people. Yes. So does it mean that the general public didn't get to view it at all? And, and was it secular or religious origin? Oh, those, those are also big questions. <laughs> um, they all require very long answers. The, the short answer about being aristocratic, it didn't start out that way. It started out, it was an amalgam of, of popular performance arts that came from the continent, from China and from Korea, also were indigenous, masked things. It, it was pretty bawdy, and they, they had popular songs, they had dances, it was, it was something that people would come to, it would attract people to come to temples and shrines. The secular and religious thing, there are different kinds of pieces that have different things, but they're all infused pretty much with a basic understanding of Buddhism and Shinto uh, 
uh, often in equal measure, even in the same piece. But sometimes a, a, a play will be focused on, for example, how a, a temple or a shrine got started, something like that. So there are religious themes, but there are also completely secular themes as well. I, yes? I was interested in the, uh, the drums, and I think in particular the taiko drum, and wondering about the, the gestures and any relation between um, the gestures, the physical gestures, and the sounds that are made. Yes. All of the drums are choreographed, as I think you noticed. And the taiko is very beautifully choreographed. Again, that will vary from school to school. They're all choreographed, but the exact choreography is a little bit different. Um, well, everything in No is choreographed like that. And so, does the sound change if you don't do the choreography? That's hard to say. I don't know. Actually, I've never seen anybody not do the choreography, so I can't really say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, it's more of an aesthetic. It's, a, it's an aesthetic of formal attention. When you're on stage, you are alert. And every move that you make is conscious. Uh, well, it becomes second nature, but you train in order for that to become second nature, and you're very careful about how you move in every respect. Yes? Is there any amount of spontaneity in the performance? If everything seems to be choreographed and notated? Well, one way that you get spontaneity is that, you remember, you have very many schools that are being involved here. And so each performance is, in a sense, unique because you don't have you don't have repertory companies where the same actors are working with the same people all the time, and you don't have long runs. You have a situation where somebody will say, "Let's put on a show, let's put on a program," and then they put out the word to the people they want to perform with, and they say, "We're performing on the 20th. Are you free?" And they say, "Yes." And then they come on the 19th. They go through some of the stuff that they need to do, and then they perform it. And then they disperse again. And so each combination is potentially unique. It's like snowflakes. <laughs> that you don't have the same people in the same roles. And the, the way that you perform that piece is going to be different depending on what the schools bring to it. And you're always listening to what other people on the stage are doing. And you're reacting to what they do. And so each performance is going to be unique. So that's where you get your spot. That's one place where you Yes. Uh, this is a bit out of question, but um, is there any connection or, or overlap whatsoever between No and Buto? I know they are um, different. But. I don't know too much about Buto, but I do know that No was one of the inspiring sources of Buto. Right. That that comes from a lot of different sources. No is one of them. Okay. But the the interest in Earth, the interest in downward movement, and being connected, being a farmer, being heavy, okay. that's No. And that's Bhutan. Uh -huh. That's in common. Okay. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned uh, a little bit earlier that um, these traditions would, would be passed down orally and kept very secretively um, among families. And what you're doing with uh, the English text is a pretty radical break from what your training was, I'm imagining. Yes. And so I'm just curious to know, like, did you have to break from your teachers, or do they do they approve of this? Um, you get a lot of different responses yeah. depending on who your teachers are. My teacher is very understanding, and, and also we're foreigners. And so, in a way, we don't fit into that category yet. I think that is slowly breaking down in the same way that it's breaking down with women. Right. Um, they, when I got my training uh, originally, that was in the, when was that? Early 80s. Early 80s. I, through the, throughout the 80s, I was uh, studying very hard when I was an apprentice at one point. Mm -hmm. So I did that traditional thing. There was nobody else that was doing that. Yeah. And they didn't know what to do with me. They were very kind and they were very uh, considerate and taught me a lot. But they didn't have, I wasn't in the hierarchy. They didn't know where to put me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's still true today. There's a slow kind of melting between amateur and professional now, where very good amateurs, um, I, I don't think just now, that's been the case for a long time. Uh, very good amateurs can kind of bleed over into the professional world and back and forth like that. And people in this troupe, there are people who are doing that. 
they're bleeding over. We perform with professionals on an equal basis in the stage, but we're not, no actors. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a uh, subliminal. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, we don't know where we are. Right. But as far as what we do with English, well, they're not far, what, they, they don't really know what we're doing. <laughs> I mean, we're doing Howl Round today, so this is going out, anybody can see it online. But usually, you know, they, we're out of their mind and out of their vision, so we can do just about anything we want. Thank you. Yeah. Yes? I want to ask you about the meaning of the dance. I see everybody has a fun top 10, and at a certain point you place it out. So I would like to know more about it. Well, if it's, a, it's up a piece of the same with the choreography with the drum, I think. The emphasis on formality, people used fans. Yeah, they were useful items. I and know, I'm a lover. I have a collection, yeah. so I'm like, oh, I'm fun. But it became very formal. And even though they don't really serve a function, for example, in the chorus, they do indicate when the chorus is ready to play or ready to sing. And they do have a certain nice feel to it. When you take up the fan, you're saying, okay, we're, we're ready to go, you know. Um, in the dances, the fan can take on uh, lots of different meanings depending on what the text is or what the meaning is. It can be a drinking cup, it can be scoop water with it. You can make it into a sword. We do it this way, keep it does it this way. <laughs> yeah, so there are different ways that you can use a fan that are prop oriented. But they will always, you know, you can't say always. <laughs> Almost always. They have a fan in their hand. The actors too, even if they're not using it, they'll have something in their right hand. And it's just a convention that is followed today. That's the best answer I've got. Thank you. <laughs> yes? Um, are there stock characters in No that span the genre uh, the way, say, they do in Comedia de la Arte? And if so, are they also characterized by typical gestures the way they might be? There are not stock characters in that way, but there, there are. The characters are determined if it's a main actor, and if you're talking about the main acting characters, uh, it's determined by the mask. And there are hundreds of varieties of masks. Um, you can use the same mask in more than one play, so it does have that kind of crossover. But they're not stock characters in that you can expect them to have the same personality or function. And so the situations are not comp composed of stock? No, they're not. Yeah. Often the, 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 the characters are historical in many cases, so they're actually based on some person's story. Um, so they're very specific. Yes. Um, I'm curious about the the uh, tuning of the flute that oh, yes. you described as out of tune. Yeah. Is it considered as is it heard as out of tune um, by the no musicians? Um, and what's the aesthetic principle behind uh, what we hear as out of tune? And how does that affect your writing, your composing? Yes. Well, those are good questions. I I say it's out of tune just because. I'm comparing it with a Western flute. I don't think that, that that issue comes up at all among traditional players. It's just their flute sound. But there is a there is this flute that looks exactly like the Nokon that doesn't have the sleeve inside. And if you play that, you know, it has the regular harmonic series and it sounds like a like a bamboo flute, you know. They put that sleeve in there on purpose mm -hmm. so that it would get a, a kind of a I don't want to call it dirty sound, but it's a it's not a pure song. And I do think that that is part of the aesthetic of no, to bring out the fact that it's an otherworldly thing. Um, that's my interpretation of it anyway. And so when you notate it? When I notate it, when I notate it, um, well, if I can, I use tradition. But when I write something that doesn't have a traditional base, I write it in Western notation. Mm -hmm. And then, then I write in the fingerings. So you can do it just with the fingerings. And it's approximate, very approximate, because each each flute is tuned a little bit differently. You can't have a, a chorus of flutes. It would sound, it would just be terrible. They're just microtonally different. And there's no way to tune them, and they don't want to tune them. So, so I, I write it in Western, and then approximate it with the fingerings. Thank you. 
Yes. Yeah. Uh, this might sound a little strange, but I noticed that you all have the same socks for like the big <laughs> toe is isolated. Is there a functional purpose for that, or is that just a stylistic thing? Uh, traditionally, Japanese take their shoes off when they go into the house, and they often wear clogs or some kind of slippers that have the toe separated. Mm. So these are very functional. You go when you get out of. I'm I'm wearing these. These are very. I should. I mean, they're pretty dirty because this floor is dirty. <laughs> but generally, you use these kind of socks in a clean environment so they stay white. And when you get out of that clean environment, you put on something that you can just slip on, like a thong or something. Uh, it looks like our time is up. Thank you very much.